Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, my name is Lisa Kimento, and I'm PJLA's Lead Assessor and Food Assessing Program Advisor. Thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, today's topic, we're going to be talking about FDA laboratory accreditation for analysis of food. Uh, this is the last program, and this is basically going to be a catch-up since the program has been in effect for a couple years now. Uh, basically, where are we at and what lessons we have learned so far. And some of the things we're going to cover today is just a little bit of background and an overview of the FDA last program. Um, we will also um, talk about when potentially the FDA might make that call on implementing the program and uh, five specific areas of food testing that are covered by the rule, as well as um, just a, an overview of the LAF, um, LAF requirements for the laboratory and then common pitfalls that laboratories are struggling with uh, since the program um, uh, started. And then also some of the questions addressed by the FDA that were um, that were asked by either by the lab or the accrediting body. So the final rule uh, was issued by the FDA on the December 3rd, 2021, and established, that's when it established the last program, and it outlined the eligibility requirements that are credit for accreditation bodies and laboratories wishing to participate in the program that will need to satisfy. The last program is voluntary for accrediting bodies and labs and testing is required only under certain circumstances. Uh, so we are approximately two years now into the program. Um, there are eight accrediting bodies recognized by the FDA and over 35 LAF accredited testing labs. If you are one of the accredited um, labs to the LAF program, your uh, certificate in your uh, laboratory name and methods that you're accredited to should be on the FDA dashboard. However, the program has not yet been fully implemented. After the FDA program is fully implemented by the FDA, the owners and consignees will use the FDA dashboard to locate a lab and request testing that they need. So this is why the FDA created that dashboard. It's just a central place for them to find a lab. And at this point, is uh, a non-LAF non accredited laboratory laboratory will no longer be receiving a request for testing from owners and consignees. So they can still do it to at this point. Uh, they, they can still use a non-LAF accredited laboratory, but after the implementation is, uh, is placed, then, um, then they won't have that option anymore. Implementation. Um, the FDA has not yet determined that sufficient laboratory capacity has been attained for any of the testing covered by the last final rule. Therefore, the use of LAF accredited laboratory for food testing is not currently required. Once the FDA has confirmed sufficient LAF accredited laboratory capacity for testing covered by CFR 11107, a document will be published in the Federal Register giving owners and consignees a six months notice that they will be required to use a LAF accredited laboratory for, for such testing. And just a little bit of overview of the LAF program. The FDA LAF program is an additional, more prescriptive set of requirements to ISO 17025 2017 standards. <clears throat> it does in a way resemble the AOAC guidance, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, the LAF program does not apply to all food testing zones. The scope of food testing covered by the LAF program is limited, but may, be, may include both product and environmental testing. How close is the FDA LAF program to being implemented? Um, very close. So at our last FDA meeting, um, the word was that the possible implementation <clears throat> of the program is projected in the year 2024. So it's just either a month or two away. So this is when uh, implementation would be, um, would be announced from the LAF, from the FDA, and then um, owners and consignees would have about uh, six months from that date to comply. <clears throat> in addition to IC 1705 requirements and the laboratory 
seeking to be accredited to the last program um, or, or are already required. <clears throat> or if they're already accredited, are assessed to the further requirements. So these are additional requirements that, um, in addition to the ISA 17025, so there are eligib eligibility requirements for the last accredited laboratories. There's impartiality and conflict of interest requirements, sampling requirements, requirements for analysis of samples, methods of analysis requirements, general requirements for submissions to FDA and requirements for submitting abridged reports and requirements for records as related to the last program. And uh, the last program gathers some laboratory requirements, uh, validation and verification beyond those required by ISO 17025, including certain test method verifications and validation and reporting requirements. Uh, the, the LAF program requires the participating lab to obtain information about the training and experience of the sample, as well as sampling plans and co sample collection reports. So if the laboratory is not doing sampling themselves, then they will be outsourcing that activity to a, um, to a sampling um, uh, organization, and then, but they will be required to get the training from them, the experience, um, as well as the sampling plans that, um, that have to go with the reports. The last program defines the elements of full analytical report, uh, the process by which participating labs may be allowed to submit abridged analytical reports, and labs submit test results to FDA only for testing that is within the last program. So nothing else, the uh, FDA doesn't want to see anything that's not last. Uh, related. So just wanted to overview the five specific areas of food testing that are covered by this rule. And um, under which circumstances will the owners and consignees be required to use a LAF accredited um, lab for testing? So these are the circumstances. So first is support of removal of import alerts for successful and consecutive testing. The second would be to support admission of import, imported food, food products uh, detained at the border. And the, these two are probably the most common reasons why um, a LAF accredited lab would be getting test, uh, testing from owners and consignees. And uh, just a side note there that the LAF final rule doesn't apply to all imported foods, only those foods that need to be tested that are on import alert or have been detained at the border. And five specific, continuing on on the five specific areas of food testing that are covered by the rule, the third one is um, follow-up testing required by existing FDA food safety regulations on sprouts, shell eggs, and bottled drinking water. So this is not really anything new, but it was put together with the uh, with the final rule when it came out back in December. So this is, these are, these are specific methodologies that relate to um, sprouts, shell eggs, and bottled drinking water. And then four and five, these are a little bit rare. So like I said, how the first, first and the second uh, specific areas were the most common ones. These are more, a bit rare. Certain administrative processes, such as testing submitted in connection with an appeal of an ad administrative detention order. And the fifth one is direct food laboratory order. Testing required under direct food laboratory order if identified or suspected problems are discovered. And FDA keeps a list of all, uh, all of these. It's all, <coughs> all online, you can uh, easily find it. So what kind of food testing labs perform this type of testing? So the lab, labs that perform covered tests of import-related foods differ from the labs that perform covered tests of shell eggs, sprouts, and bottled drinking water. Um, so those are two different types of labs. The labs that test import-related foods are located close to ports of entry and specialize in testing protocols 
for foods based on import 35 alerts, which is the automatic detention list. And then the labs that test shell eggs, sprouts, and bottled drinking water are more geographically dispersed to account for proximity as a factor determining lab use. And this is something that the FDA was, is in the process of continuous evaluation uh, as far as the implementation. They are looking to make sure they have enough labs at, um, at the ports, and they're also looking for enough labs that are distributed ar around the country um, to support the, um, the bottled water, the shell eggs, and the sprout testing. And now let's go on to requirements for the laboratories. This is just an overview or a reminder to some of you. Um, the laboratory must be accredited to 1705-2017 uh, to be able to apply for the LAF accreditation program. Um, if the laboratory is not accredited to 1705, then they can seek some accreditation to 1705 at the same time. So that would be called an initial accreditation. Um, the laboratory must successfully pass APT proficiency testing within the last 12 months or comparison program if not, no PT is available. And results are to be reported to PGLA within 30 days of receipt. And this is a, a, a very important um, clause there is that some of you have already, um, are already accredited with PGLA and um, the in your, in your share folders, you will see that there is uh, there's a LAF PT folder, and within that PT, PT folder, there are going to be years, uh, 2023, 2024, 2025, and so on. So every year, you're expected to upload PT testing results related to your LAF-accredited test. Um, and then uh, PGLA will send, um, will send a memo to the lab after granting accreditation to the LAF program, instructing the laboratory where to upload the PT results. Um, so just, uh, just as I said right now, so it, there was a folder in the share file that um, the laboratories will upload that P, PT data in. And then PGLA reviews, tracks um, the PT participation and results. So if the laboratory is not doing that. Um, PGLA will notify um, the laboratory, and um, and then also assessor will be following up on that in the next assessment. The use of reference materials or quality control samples with each batch of samples tested under the last program are required, and also an on-site assessment is required is required at least once every two years. So this is a requirement directly from the FDA, is that um, I, they want an assessor to be on site. Um, so it can't, be a re it can't be a remote activity two years in a row. Now, as far as methods, uh, this question kind of came up before as to when laboratories would be applying for the LAF, LAF program, they would say, well, what methods do you recommend? Well, the FDA does not specify which methods the labs must use. So there is no defined inventory of methods. Um, however, the methods must be fully validated and verified, and FDA will confirm that they are. Um, there is an exception, though, uh, as I said earlier, directed um, if, uh, if there is a directed food order um, the directed food order will um, state which method must be used to test the food in question. Or if it's a shell, shell, shell egg product, sprouts, or bottled drinking water, those are all have uh, method requirements uh, for the FDA. And then the requirements for the FDA last program can be found at FDA Title 21, Chapter 1, uh, Subchapter A, Part 1. Sub, subpart R, laboratory accreditation for, lab, for analysis of food. So if you just type that in into Google, it should take you right over to the requirements. Now, as far as common pitfalls, so these are some of the things that we have learned um, over the year or two, um, things that are coming up, and um, some of this information was uh, brought to us uh, from the FDA in our quarterly meeting with them. Um, so if the lab is following an official method in all may without modification, 
a record of verification is acceptable to submit to the FDA and present to the assessor for review during an assessment. However, if a lab has made modifications to a method and developed an internal method, a full validation is required. So this is the same requirement as ISO 17025, um, but uh, the FDA would like to see the verification um, for the official method or a full method validation for, um, for any in-house developed method or modified method. So some of the issues that FDA has been seeing uh, over time is uh, with validations and verifications uh, that are submitted by the lab. They are either incomplete or unorganized. Um, so they, this was a t conversation that we had with them, um, is that the, um, the packages, the validation packages and the verification packages have to be very complete, have to be organized. So it's when somebody uh, takes it to review that it's all flowing without um, any issues without having them to go back or ask questions. Um, the FDA reviewers ask that any multiple attachments are labeled appropriately to give an indication of a continuation or an end of a full document. So as you can, can imagine, these, um, these uh, full analytical reports, they are, they're hundreds of pages long, hundreds. Um, so this is the, the FDA reviewers have to go through this many pages for review. And also FDA wants to see all the raw data in the packages. So the raw data meaning uh, raw data for validations, raw data for verifications, and raw data for any testing that's lack accredited. Next is um, when the conversation was about validations, FDA said that the, they do have a guidance document for microbiological microbiological and chemical methods validation. And you can find this on the FDA website. Um, it's called Food Program Methods Validation Process and Guidelines. It's a, a very comprehensive document, uh, which I would think you would find very useful if you are struggling in that area on how to put a method validation together. FDA asks also that the laboratory references validation guidance that is being followed. So whether it's FDA's guidance or another reputable source. So um, in your validation report, you would want to put down reference which um, guidance uh, was followed so that they know what to look for when the, the reviewers are reviewing it. Um, labs submitting very large reports and making large files that are being split up are not labeled properly. So this is another common thing that the FDA has been seeing. Um, so ensure that each file is labeled appropriately. So it would have a title and then it would have one of one of uh, one or two of two or one of three, two of three, three of three, and so on, however many files you have. And then upload as few total attachments as possible. This was a request from them. And um, it is time sensitive to open each attachment separately. So do not upload individual attachments, but rather large files which are labeled appropriately. So this was request from them. Now, one of the things that the FDA wanted to put out there is that the labs cannot use the FDA logo on any materials, reports, or web pages. This is a very serious issue. FDA does not give out any sort of logos for this. Um, so if you have a, um, um, if you have been using a, some, some sort of uh, FDA logo, please stop uh, this because it is not allowed. Now, some of the questions that have been addressed by FDA, and these questions have been brought forth to them either by the labs themselves or by the accrediting bodies, which I thought would be um, interesting for uh, you to know how they answered it. So. Under the last program, must laboratories collect the samples? So the last rule does not define who collects the samples. The last rule requires that the sampler is qualified, both by training and experience, to collect the samples. So the samples may be collected by the last accredited lab or a third, um, third party sampler or by the owner or consignee, as long as they are trained and experienced 
um, in this area. The key is that the sampler is qualified. The lab is responsible for obtaining documentation of qualifications of the sampler, sampling plans, and sample collection reports related to the food testing and submitting them with each analytical test report. And is this program applicable outside of the US? And this program is actually open to both domestic and foreign accreditation bodies and laboratories. Requirements are the same. The only restriction is that um, that may impact the foreign laboratories is that the food testing conducted on food articles offered for import into the US must be tested after the food article has arrived into the US. Unless the owner and consignee has a written approval from the FDA that a sample taken prior to arrival is or would be representative of the sample offered for import into the US. So there's a little bit of a gray line, um, but it could work. Will the FDA audit private laboratories? So the recognized accrediting body, so in this case PGLA, has the responsibility to assess the laboratory. FDA's role is to oversee the accredited, the accredited laboratory. However, FDA may review the performance of LAF accredited laboratories at any time to determine whether the LAF accredited laboratory continues to comply with the applicable requirements. FDA may conduct an on-site review of a LAF accredited laboratory at any reasonable time with or without a recognized accreditation body or its officers, employees, or other agents present to review the performance of the LAF accredited laboratory un under this subpart. Certain review activities may be conducted remotely if it will not aid in the review of to conduct them on site. FDA may report any observations and deficiencies identified during its review of LAF accredited laboratory performance under the subpart to the recognized accrediting accreditation body. So um, it's definitely a possibility they can show up at a laboratory with or without PGLA. Um, so it's just something that the laboratories need to be aware of and always be ready for either PGLA or FDA. Does the last final rule apply to all food testing? The answer to that is no. Food testing, including environmental testing, is required to be conducted by the last accredited laboratory only under certain cir circumstances specified in the rule, which we just went over. Those were the five special uh, circumstances. Food, the term food includes articles of food, food or drink for men or animals. So that would include pet food as well as articles used for components of food, such as raw materials or other ingredients. Does the LAF program apply to dietary supplements? Yes. If it fell into one of the requested testing circumstances, such as food that is subject to detention without physical examination or import alert. And then the, as far as the recognized labs and their scopes are identified on the FDA dashboard. So if you are already accredited laboratory, your laboratory is recognized there and it's publicly viewable at this, um, uh, at this address. And that concludes our um, presentation today. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Um, you can email me at lacumenco.pjlabs.com and I would be more than happy to answer your questions related to the last program.